All right, Orange Nation, you saw him in the Philadelphia Inquirer this morning, and this afternoon you see him on your computer screens. He is Rob Long, Syracuse University, class of 2012, and we are so thrilled, Rob, to have you with us for our, as we hang out for the next hour. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So has the big workout happened yet today, or are we uh, keeping you from the field? No, we're saving it for the afternoon today. Going to work out in the nice uh, hot 90 degree weather today. Yeah, is it pretty toasty in Philly? Yeah, it's very toasty. I uh, had to put the air conditioning on, so I had to make the move from open windows to air conditioning. So how cool was that this morning to wake up and see uh, your face in the Philadelphia Inquirer? Not a bad way to start the day, huh? No, it was not a bad way to start the day. Now I'm here with you guys, so I'm pretty excited. It's a, it's a good day so far. Awesome. So tell me what that piece was all about. He reached out to you last week and just, you know, wanted to share your story about moving forward, right? That's what our whole afternoon is about, staying positive moving forward. That's right. Um, so uh, a couple of my buddies had made a video uh, to try and help, I guess, raise some awareness about uh, getting me to the NFL. And so uh, the video was sent out in a bunch of different places, and they contacted a bunch of different news outlets and the Philadelphia Inquirer had uh, contacted me and they said they wanted to follow up and do a story uh, in relation to the video and and it just so happened it came out uh, today and perfectly lined up with the Google Hangout and uh, so it, it was a really it was a cool piece it was just kind of about my story of uh, where I am now and trying to get you know to the NFL uh, you know from my time in Syracuse and and moving on and kind of getting through all the, the, the medical issues and, and moving on, taking the next step. And for those of you who are watching the video that Rob is referencing, if you haven't seen it, it is just below the link that you're watching um, on our Hangout page. And after this is over, you can certainly take a look because that was phenomenal. That was high school buddies that put that together, right? Really yeah, well. uh, it was, yeah, it was really well done. Um, the, the one kid is obviously uh, in, in film and he does editing and has done some work out in Los Angeles. I think it's quite evident by how well the film is done. But uh, yeah, they you know kind of just took it upon themselves to do it, and um, it was really cool. And I you know had no idea what was really going on. They just kind of were asking me questions and and filming me while I was kicking, and they put together this great piece. So it was awesome to have. Nice. So this next hour is really all about you and where you've been and where you are now and where you're going. And for anyone watching, I've already seen a few questions come in. Um, Rob Long SU is the hashtag we're using. And he'll be answering your questions throughout the hour. I'll share some thoughts as well and, and ask questions too, Rob. But I see them already starting to um, pour in. How did this whole project start? This question comes from Ted. When you, you know, was this your buddy's idea? You wanted to do the video? How did that all come together? Because it's really seemed to take off. Um, it, it, it was really it started. My one buddy is he's very good with film, and so I'd asked him to you know take some video of me kicking so I could put it together and send it to teams, and you know I'd have some you know video evidence of me kicking and how I've been doing, and it's something I do every couple months to just send out and update them and let them know I'm still kicking and. Um, and he kind of said, you know, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. He said, you know, but do you mind if I take some extra uh, footage and, you know, I'm going to sit down and ask you some questions. I was, had no idea what it was all going to come to, but I said, yeah, I have no problem. So I sat down and uh, lo and behold, he put a lot of time, a lot of effort in and um, he did this great video and it's called the Rob Long Project and it's something that they've been trying to send out to teams and and kind of just create some awareness uh, across the country to hopefully find somebody to give me a shot. So I guess take me back. We talked a little bit before we went live to December of 2010. And when, I mean, your whole world, you were on your way. You were yeah. a Big East punter, all, had all these accolades coming your way, and now, boom, in one instance. Kind of take me back. Um, yeah, so uh, I had have some symptoms during the season and I had some headaches and it started to get progressively worse as the season wore on. And, uh, it was something that by the end of November, it was becoming a daily thing. It was becoming very less tolerable on a regular basis. And the, the headaches were consistent and I'll never remember or I'll never forget, uh, Thanksgiving morning I woke up and I got sick and I couldn't stop throwing up for, 
you know, almost two hours and I had no idea what was going wrong. I hadn't been out the night before. I hadn't eaten anything unusual. So it was something that it, it felt strange. And um, so I think about a week later, I ended up uh, going to get an MRI at, uh, at Krauss. And the lady came back and she just looked ghost white. And I was, kind of felt a little weird, but I didn't notice anything. And the radiologist came in and she said, you know, everything's normal. You just got to run a couple more tests. And then, uh, you know, I finished up that MRI and went back to the football facility. And uh, a couple hours later, they sat me down. They said, you have a rather large growth in your brain and uh, you need to see a specialist, you know, first thing in the morning. And so that's kind of when everything started that I was on this journey that I had absolutely no idea what I was going to get myself into. And I had no idea what to expect. And, uh, it was, it was a wild, wild ride, but, um, I've come out on the, the positive end of things and, and it's, I'm glad I went through it. Uh, it's taught me a lot. It's, um, something that I'll always keep with me and a lot of, uh, a lot of lessons were learned, and I met a lot of great people. So I think a lot of positive came out of it, even though it was such a, you know, a negative thing. I think that was your theme throughout all of it. I remember reading the the hashtag "Stay Positive" <laughs> like through everything, all your fans yeah. reading that. That you had the whole Orange Nation using "Stay Positive." Chuck in North Carolina asks, "How did you stay positive?" I mean, when you you have your whole life ahead of you, you're 20, 21, 22 years old. And this is happening. How do you keep your, you know, head up? How do you stay like that through? Uh, it was tough. I mean, it was not easy. And the support that I re received from the people in Syracuse was, you know, nothing short of incredible. And uh, it helped so much, you know, to come home every day from treatment. And you know, there'd be a letter or a package or something in the mail from, you know, somebody, uh, some Syracuse fan somewhere, and. Uh, it, it was always nice to have that that little extra push and motivation. And my personal drive always was to play football again. And that was something that I, I I spoke with my doctors about. You know, the day that I sat with the surgeon, I said, you know, I want to be able to play football again. And he kind of looked at me a little funny, but you know, he said, okay, like let's, let's get this taken care of then. So I had. Um, you know, went through everything, my surgery, and you know, having that goal at the end of, of doing something other than, you know, just living, like to, to have that goal of pursuing football or pursuing that job or that dream that I always wanted, then that's what, you know, drove me every day to go to the gym and work out, to, you know, go and get my chemo, go and get radiation when it was, you know, tiring and, it was not fun, but, you know, I knew there was better things at the end of it. Let's just put it out there that two weeks after brain surgery, you were kicking again. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that was correct. I was trying something to kick like that. I actually, uh, when we went to the Pinstripe Bowl, I kind of was talking to uh, my teammates, and I put my cleats on, and they were like, what are you, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I ain't come all this way to – come to Yankee Stadium and not at least try and kick in Yankee Stadium. So I put my cleats on and I hit a couple of balls in the pregame and I actually did all right, you know, all things considered. Um, so that was a really cool experience. And, you know, the fact that I got to, to punt in Yankee Stadium, unfortunately I didn't get to play, but um, the fact that I had to be there, be with my team and, and to kick, it was, was really cool. And um, even at that point, that wasn't even – uh, the worst of it, I think the worst of it was, you know, after that one, you know, the treatment came because up until that point, I'd only had the surgery. So um, it was, uh, it was a, a cool experience. That whole week was awesome. The pinstripe bowl in Syracuse um, and getting able to, and being able to win was, you know, unbelievable. Um, so that was, you know, just one of those things that it was all that more special to, to be there um, and be a part of it. So surgery never affected your uh, world's most flexible hamstring. That yeah. that stayed with you, right? Yeah, but, no, that stayed with me. That's always a that's a good thing to have as a punter because it, yeah. it it stayed uh, stayed flexible. I was always limber, so that always helped me. But you did relearn your whole technique, right? You had to, I mean, through all. Yeah, the, it took uh, a long time, but I I did uh, eventually learn everything, and and I've been working to not only learn what I was doing, but to get better, 
and trying to enhance everything that I, um, you know, had before to just kind of better myself and put myself in an even better position to, to come to the next level at the NFL and excel. So we've got a question from Joseph who asks, what do you think your journey means to others who are going through something similar? You know, what do you think? What um, do you them be able to watch? I I just know that when I was there, I would go obviously to the hospital every day and get treatment. And you know, I obviously saw so many people that were going through something similar to what I was going through, and um, and they didn't have the support network that I was so fortunate to have, you know, I had my family, obviously, and then I had this whole uh, second family of Syracuse people who just, you know, took care of me, basically sent me letters and all this other stuff. And it was tough to kind of see people who were mostly, I, I mean, all older than I was to go through something. And I kind of opened up my whole experience to, to everybody else and um, it wasn't always easy but I wanted to uh, to share my story because I knew other people were going to go through something similar or were going through something similar that it was uh, important to share that it was you know something that it's not fun while you're doing it but you can enjoy every day anyway and you can still come out better on the other end of everything and that you don't ever lose sight of all the positive that there is in, in the world um, because you know it, it, it is it's a tough time but and it wasn't always fun having cameras film me and, and talk and do interviews but it was something that I knew is for, for a greater good to, to share my story that other people can reach out and say hey I'm going through this and I can say you know I went through it too and you know you can make it and you'll do fine I think seeing that video of you lifting and doing push-ups and everything with you, you lost your hair, you were deep in treatment at that point. Yeah. And, I mean, if that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. Yeah, I kind of look back. I'm not really sure what I was thinking at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, by doing the workouts or by Yeah, your life? no, by doing the workouts. <laughs> I wasn't even sure that was always a good idea. But um, no, it was important for me to stay active. And I would have, you know, not benefited from just sitting there, you know, doing nothing. So it was good to, to get out and work out. And um, it, I didn't really realize how much uh, the workouts, like, took out of me until more recently when the chemo finally left my system. I only finished last year, so, and I was on it for a full year. So it takes a while for everything to get out of your system and your your muscles and your blood levels and everything to kind of rejuvenate and uh, I started to find out that I could, you know, do workouts in consecutive days again. And whereas I would go and I would kick or I'd go and work out and I would just be tired for the next, like two or three days. And it was just one of those things you just like kind of just dealt with it and adjusted and, and made the most of, you know, whatever you had. Well, speaking of workouts, workouts of the NFL kind, um, Ed down in Richmond, Virginia asks, who have you worked out with so far? Any tryouts on the horizon? Kind of what's been your experience uh, so far with the NFL? Uh, I've been fortunate to, to have a couple workouts. Um, the the big thing with me is I, I want to find somebody that, you know, will give me a workout and then ultimately give me a chance to, to be with the team. Most of the workouts that you go to, you'll be judged on maybe 10 or 12 punts and that's all they take and they look at that and they kind of say, okay, well, it was either good or it was either not good. And then I've had good workouts and it's just other circumstances. You know, I had a workout in Philadelphia and Chicago that both went really well. And then the coaches, uh, both coaching staffs were fired after the season. So all those workouts kind of get wiped out when everybody leaves and now you're dealing with a whole new, uh, whole new, whole new management system. Um, so it's just kind of finding the right opportunity at the right time. And it's tough because there's only 32 jobs. There's only one punter on each team. So it's trying to find the right opportunity. And um, I know once I get with a team and I'm there for an extended period of time, they'll uh, see all, the, all that I have to offer, that, you know, the work ethic, the time that I put in, and everything else that I bring. Um, Major. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Uh, everything else that I bring to the team. 
you majored in marketing and supply chain when you were here. You've actually had job opportunities in uh, you know career wise for those yeah. types of jobs, but you've turned those down, right, to pursue. Um, yeah, I think at this point, I, um, I I feel like I will always be able to uh, work at some point. You know, I'll be able to do uh, an office job or, or whatever else it is, and. Um, I would be happy to do something like that, but I don't want to, uh, you know, put out anybody who would hire me because my dream right now is to play football, and I would, you know, be happy to do something that if I could, you know, work and and work out and kick and train and everything all at once, I, I think that'd be a great opportunity. Um, but as far as starting starting like a full career, I'm, you know, going to try this and and hopefully make this happen. And if not, I know I have a lot of good job opportunities and I have a, a good resume built up that I think uh, I can hopefully find good opportunities you know, in the workplace. I mean anyone who thinks that uh, going for the NFL isn't networking is uh, kind of crazy, right? That's what you do every day, right? You're making Yeah, it's a lot, of, a lot of talking to, you know, coaches and, and NFL personnel and it's not always, you know, fun to call people who are general managers of football teams and kind of just cold call them and say, hey, I'm Rob, I'm a punter from Syracuse, <laughs> yeah. do you need a punter? And, uh, but, I mean, it teaches you skills, and I, I kind of have learned how to approach that situation. I, you know, I understand that they're busy people, and, and they have a ton of things going on. I'm probably the least of their worries, you know, that if I call them, they don't think twice about it. But, of course, you know, the person, I'm on the other end, like, got sweaty hands and, you know, make sure don't want to say anything stupid, but uh, it's always, it's good, it is, it's good, you know, job experience to, to understand how to talk to people and how to interact and especially with people you don't have prior connections with. You said you actually didn't punt until you were in 11th grade, right? This wasn't yeah, it was uh, my, uh, it was my first, <laughs> no, no I, was a, I was a hockey player all my life and um, played hockey since I was about four years old. I didn't pick up football until ninth grade, and I didn't start punting until eleventh grade. And uh, at that point, I kind of fell in love with it. it. It was a challenging thing to learn how to do, and I fortunately had, uh, you know, eleventh grade. I, I started to learn it. Twelfth grade, I really got into it, and uh, Syracuse offered me a scholarship after uh, my senior season at uh, at high school, and I was fortunate enough to to go and take it and, and make the most of it. We actually had a question about hockey, and since you mentioned it, I'll <laughs> pop it in now. Uh, who do you think wins the cup this year? Asks Ted. Oh, um, <laughs> or well, is my, it my team? Yeah, I know my team. Uh, the Flyers are not in it for the first time in like 15 years. Yeah. They were, haven't been in the playoffs, so that's a little upsetting. But um, it was. Uh, I watched the last night's game, the Kings and the Sharks, which was a great game. I'm a huge hockey fan. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Uh, I think the Blackhawks, if they can win tonight, they have, uh, I think, game seven against Detroit. So I think if they can win and keep going, they got a talented team. Sam here in the Alumni Relations Office likes that answer. Does he? <laughs> we have a fan right next to me here. Yeah, I got a good team. So another question that came in, um, and I'm actually not familiar with it, so this will be news to me as well, is what's the purpose of this Lift for Life that the Syracuse football team is doing this summer? What is that? Um, so myself and uh, Sam Rogers and uh, Eric Morris, two current players on the team, we're starting an Uplifting Athletes chapter at Syracuse University. And uh, Uplifting Athletes is a, it's an organization that benefits and, and raises money for rare diseases. Um, so there's different chapters at different universities. Penn State has a chapter, Nebraska has a chapter, uh, Missouri, um, Nebraska, and a couple other schools that have these chapters for uh, raising money for rare diseases. And so we are starting Syracuse's uh, chapter this summer, and we're kicking it off with a Lift for Life on uh, June 29th, I believe. And uh, we're really excited about it, and our rare disease is going to be brain cancer obviously because that's what I had and uh, we're going to try and uh, raise money and raise awareness and um, hopefully make it a tradition at Syracuse to, to have you know athletes in the future be, become uh, a part of the whole Uplifting Athletes um, organization. How would you suggest people get involved with that? 
if they're interested, or is that kind of closed to a small group now, or what would you say? Um, so what's going to happen is is we're we're still in the uh, launching phases, so we are uh, currently. Uh, working with the university to get everything approved, the website approved, and um, it will be up and running this summer. Um, we will uh, be asking fans to come out to the Lift for Life and um, and and become a part of the whole organization and kind of have the whole community uh, really gather behind it and and have it something that we can always have uh, at Syracuse for a long time. Um, so what it'll be, the first uh, fundraiser is going to be the Lift for Life uh, in June, and then after that we're going to start working towards building other events and other fundraisers, and it'll be a year-round thing, and hopefully we can get uh, uh, some local companies to sponsor, like uh, $10 for a touchdown, or uh, that Syracuse scores every, every game, or, you know, $50 for every field goal or something like that, and then that'll all go towards the Uplifting Athletes Organization and uh, funding research and awareness towards brain cancer. It sounds like, and this is something we hear a lot from our alumni, regardless of their major or what their experience was, you've graduated, you've left Syracuse, but you haven't, right? Right, you yeah. haven't left Syracuse. Kind of no. tell me what role the school, these people play um, in your life every day and why you come back? Uh, I just, for one, I don't live very far away. It's only a four hour drive up to the Northeast Extension in 81. So that always but, makes it easy. there's traffic, right? Which is. Oh, well, yeah, unless there's traffic, yeah. Um, no, I, it's an awesome school and the, I don't, you don't realize until you leave the, the, the community and the alumni associations that surround it are just, incredible and everything that you can uh, there's I think <laughs> alumni organizations in every city that I could find I mean I know the big one ones, yeah. yeah the one in DC one in Philadelphia both helped out big time when we did the uh, race for hope uh, back in May and um, it was something that was just it's incredible everybody everywhere you turn you run into somebody who has Syracuse and uh, some affiliation with the university and it's really cool to have that large community, that large backing of um, people in industry uh, and, and many different industries that you run into you know, on a regular basis. Do you get a chance to talk to the current players? Have you, you know, been able to meet with Coach Schaefer to talk to them? Like, like what do you say to them to inspire? I mean, it must be so neat as a former player to come back and, and watch as the team grows and, and grows together now with a new coach. We'll yeah. all be watching that. Well, uh, coach Schaefer's a great guy, and I was very fortunate to be uh, coached by him while I was there. And uh, I think coming up this year is going to be the last year of kids that I played with. So. The kids that are seniors this year are going to be the last group of guys that were freshmen when I was a senior. So um, this will be the last guys I played with, but I'm, I, I've had the opportunity to go back and meet other guys that are that came in after me and create friendships, and, and that bond is still there, even though we didn't necessarily play together, but we played with the same team and, and, and with the same name and, and still wore the S. So it makes it all very uh, – very special, and you have that connection with those players no matter what, even if you played with them or if they played 20 years before you. I mean, I've had uh, former players reach out from, I mean, decades before I ever played just to, to say hi and to, to, you know, go get lunch or, you know, whatever it is, and that's really cool to have that, that whole network. As you, you know, think about your future in terms of, you know, moving on, to the NFL, how will you stay still connected to the SU community? What are your, you know, thoughts on that? Um, I don't think it'll be very hard. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I, I I love you know Syracuse and you know this weekend going to the Final Four. Um, I got to spend time with a lot of the lacrosse team that was there while I was there, and uh, you know, again, we didn't play you know with each other, you know, in separate sports. We were separate sports, but we still always had that connection, and we always were able to, to bond at school. And then even outside of campus, we would go and hang out, and the opportunity to hang out with all those guys um, this past weekend, it's always always a blast. And, you know, 
it's just nice to have that that common bond of Syracuse and and to go to the game and see you know twenty five thousand fans yeah. you know in a different city than Syracuse you know rooting for the same team so that, that's really neat to have and you're not going somewhere and you know there might be one or two or three but there was I mean, a large contingent of Syracuse people this weekend in the Philadelphia area, and that's pretty awesome. Jumping back to campus, to student athletes who might be watching or will watch the recording, what do you say to them about finding that balance between I'm a college student and I have professors yeah. and I have classes and I have tests and papers, slash I'm also on this team and in your case have dreams of going pro. How did you find that balance in school? You know, how do you set your priorities and manage your time and, and things like that? Well, I think there was always, like, I broke it down into, like, three categories. There was your football life, your social life, and your academic life, and you can really only do good at two of them. So it's, <laughs> it's picking the right two is the big, is the big challenge. And uh, uh, I know freshman year I picked the wrong two, and I was good at football and I was good at socializing. But after that, it was uh, you realize you know it's important to get your grades and and important to to do your your schoolwork and practice your sport and that's basically for most of the kids you know that's why you're there at Syracuse is because you were a gifted athlete and you were given this opportunity and so I think it was always important for me to not take advantage of that opportunity not to be like oh well I'm here and. I, I was obviously good enough in, in high school to get here, and there's no need for me to, you know, try and get any better. I'm good at where I'm at. and um, So I think making sure that you always continue to get better at your sport, you know, whether you have a professional sport or not. You know, I know a lot of the, uh, I guess, Olympic sports, there's not that uh, opportunity to, you know, pursue an NFL career in, you know, field hockey or women's lacrosse. But it still gives you a great amount of satisfaction to excel at that. And I think you could ask the, the Syracuse women. I mean, they were able to get to the Final Four, and I bet that was pretty incredible for them. Um, but just finding the balance of making sure you get your work done. Syracuse gives you all the opportunity in the world with tutors and help and you know study table and everything that you, know, you, you should be – able to get everything done that you need to get done while, you know, still doing your sports and, you know, still making a lot of great friends and having a great time uh, on campus. Rewinding to when you were playing at SU in the Carrier Dome, can you take me back to the first time you, you know, made a punt inside the Carrier Dome? And yeah, it was Washington. It was against the University of Washington. It was my freshman year. We wore all orange jerseys and there was 50,000 people in the stands and it was a pretty crazy game. It was like a nationally televised game on ESPN. And uh, I remember, I, it, like, they told me I had to go in and punt, and I just wasn't nervous at all. And I just – I had practiced so much, and I guess I just didn't really even think about it. And I came off the field, and the other two kids that uh, were kickers on the team at the time were like, I was so nervous. <laughs> I was like, I, I was fine. I you know, didn't think much of it. I you know, just went out and – I remember I hit it 50 yards, and I hit it in the end zone, but that was okay. It was my first one. I hit it well, and um, it started my career off right, I guess. That's awesome. I miss, you know, the, do you ever pay attention to the fan? Like, I hear the fans next to me who are yelling. Like, I know you don't hear all of us specifically, but yeah. to the player on the field, pay attention to what we're all hooting and hollering at you, you know, during a game. I've always um, – I think – my whole thing, and I think what benefited me in college, no matter where I played, I kind of only just focused on the football field because if you're at practice or if you're in the game, like you're on the football field. Anything that surrounds the football field doesn't really affect you or the game. So the crowd, the, the stadium itself, I know we played at Penn State, there's 107,000 people there. We played at Iowa, there were 70,000 people there. And so it can be intimidating if you let it, but if you don't really recognize it, you just kind of ignore the fact that it's there and just focus yeah. on what you have to do. And you know, I thought the the support from the fans was awesome while I was there, and um, it was something that I always liked after the game. I kind of would take it in 
look around at whatever stadium I was in and, and kind of take it all in. But in the, in the pregame, I didn't really look around much. It was mostly just focusing on the field. And even during the game, it's just kind of ignore anything that was going on in the crowd. All right. So we have another question from Joseph who asks, how was it being a captain for two years as a punter? And, and you know, would you ever consider going into a coaching role as opposed to maybe player first and coach? Is that something, you know, did you like that responsibility, that level of leadership? Yeah, it was something. I was a, a, a captain my junior year, and um, that was an, it was an eye-opening experience. It kind of, it, it, it definitely was not something that they just gave you a title and you didn't do anything, you know. It was, you had to make a lot of hard decisions, and we made, um, you know, decisions about kids being, kept on or kicked off a team and that's kind of hard and you're uh, I think I was 18 years old at the time and you're kind of deciding somebody else's fate you know a fellow teammate's fate and it's not an easy decision to make and um, th there was many occasions where it was just uh, big decisions that affected lives other than your own that you realize that there's a lot of responsibility to this role and um, I was thankful you know as a junior I had you know, great co-captains. I had Art Jones and Mike Owen and Greg Paulus, who were awesome. Um, they were a tremendous amount of support, and you know, we were able to talk to them. And I still talk to all those guys. Um, that we had that, you know, that bond and that understanding of what you know we had to do, what was best for the team, and um, it was a tremendous honor to be put in that role uh, twice. And it was. Uh, it was a great experience, and I, you know I'm thankful that I was you know thought of highly enough to to be placed in that role by my teammates. So it was exciting. It was um, it was definitely challenging though, and and it was uh, it was just a cool cool thing to have a cool thing to have attached to my name that I was the captain for two years at, at such a great school. So could you see? coaching being part of your future even if it was just you know high school if it was going to the college level is that um, I did actually uh, a coach um, my high school last year I helped out and, and helped with the kickers and uh, I had a great time doing that and I think it was a, you know a ton of fun the kid that I got to work with was awesome and we had uh, all sorts of fun you know, during the year and, you know, going to games and, and being a part of that and still being involved in football was tremendous. Um, so I, it is something I could possibly do in my future. It was, uh, uh, I know the, the lives of the coaches, you know, once you get to the Division One level and the pro level, it's it's from pretty serious business and there's not a whole lot of job security. So that's not always <laughs> the best combination, but um, it, it uh it, it's something that's intriguing because it keeps you around the sport, and it's something that I was obviously around so much for so long that it, to continue to be able to be around it would be great. And you know, if that's something I can do in the future, it's definitely uh, you know a path that I would explore. I just noticed that that question about the lift for life that you're doing that came from Sam Rogers. <laughs> yeah. He, he's the one who asked. He's, he's the one who's involved with it, right? So he's the one. Yeah, who no, asked. Sam probably. Uh, that question. Good job, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I didn't put him off to that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you? Um, a couple more questions coming in, but one from me. I know you know you wake up in the morning and it's five thirty a.m. and I really don't want to work out. How do you stay dedicated to going to that field every day? I mean. Pretty much. Week, whatever it is. And how do you, you know, does what you went through help that dedication? How, how do you balance that? Um, I think it does because I kind of realized, you know, where I was and the fact that I was given a second chance to, to kind of live my life because, you know, there was no guarantees going into this that I was going to come out of it. And so – the fact that you are given that opportunity and I was given that opportunity at such a young age to kind of reevaluate what I wanted to do and uh, how I want to go about it, you know, that was going to fall on me and nobody else, you know, nobody was going to sit there and tell me to go to the field every day. No NFL coach was going to call me and say, hey, did you work out today? Like it, it, it was upon, you know, me and, and, and me only to, to go to the field and to spend the time to kick and to do drills and, to do all the stuff that's not really fun to do, but 
um, you know, be a part uh, of working out is a part of working out is just going and having, you know, that drive to, to go and do it and, and get better every day, even though there's nobody there watching because when it comes down to it and a team does call and you no, know, if I haven't been working out, then it's kind of tough because then I know that I kind of, you know, screwed up because I didn't do all that I could do. So I just want to make sure that I'm ready, you know, whenever a team does call that, I'm there and that I can do whatever they ask me to do when I when I get that call. And I know you said in the video, the Rob Long story, that you know your experience having cancer, you think will make you an even better addition to an NFL team, right? Why and why is that? Uh, I think it just, like I said, it just gives me a different outlook on everything. And unless you go through it, it's something that's hard to explain. Um, you know the fact that. You know, there were nights where I didn't know if I'd wake up the next morning or if, you know, I had, you know, a day left, 10 days left, six months, six years or anything. It's just that unknown factor that you sit there and you go to the doctor's office and, or you, you go to your parents or anybody and you just want somebody to be like, you know what, you're going to be fine, like nothing to worry about, but nobody could do that. And that's what, you know, made it hard. And so that's what I learned a lot from that there's a lot of, uh, you know, different experience that uh, comes with it. That um, it, it's it, it gives you a lot of different qualities. You know, as far as leadership and perspective that you know I can give to people that uh, I don't think other people my age always have. So I think that the the leadership aspect of it, and um, I think there's just a total package thing that I can you know bring to a football team aside from, you know, being a good punter. Excited from the world's most flexible hamstring. Right? Yeah. We've already established that. <laughs> You're right. Um, talk about that six-week follow-up appointment. You talked about it in the, the video as well, when the doctor wasn't expecting to see much progress. And then, like, I got chills listening to you yeah. say that. He brought you in side by side. Take us through that. Yeah, so um, I had finished – uh, I finished surgery on the 14th, and they had to take a month off to let my brain heal from surgery. And then I started six and a half weeks of chemo and radiation every day, and that was through February. Um, then on, and then we had to wait again to let my brain kind of heal from all the chemo and radiation. And then on March 28th, I went back, and I had a, an MRI. Um, I think the day prior on the 27th. So my checkup was on the 28th and um, leading up to this, I, we had talked to the doctor and we're like, you know, what do you expect from this MRI? Like, what are we looking for? What is, you know, are we looking for, you know, a new tumor? Are we looking for, you know, anything? What is, we have no idea. It was total unknown. And um, he said, well, honestly, there's probably not going to be able to see anything really. It's going to be, still so much irritation from the radiation, from the chemo, that um, it'll probably just kind of look like a bunch of mush. <laughs> like it's just not going to not gonna be a clear picture just because of all the irritation. So we're like, all right. So uh, I got the MRI, and uh, I went back on the, the 28th. I walked into the hospital, the cancer center, and the doctor practically met us, like, in the lobby, my neurosurgeon, and he was like, and, you know, we didn't see the nurse. I didn't get my blood. I didn't get you know my blood pressure. I didn't get anything. He said, "Come, come with me. Like, you need to see this." Um, and he's like, "I got something I need to show you." And I was like, "All right." And so he goes and he just pulls up, uh, I think, this side by side picture of my brain um, on my birthday, December twentieth, my pre uh, pre surgery scans, so, which I had on my birthday. So he pulls all that up, and then he pulls up my scan from the, the, the day prior. And on on the left, there's, like, the massive tumor, and on the right, there's just nothing. And my, it looked like a normal, healthy brain. And there was, like, it, there was no irritation. There was only a small little bit of scar tissue remaining from surgery, but there was no, like, cancer. There was no tumors, and it was just, like, 
I was like, wait, what? Like, uh, what happened? <laughs> and he said, you know, it, you know, it's gone. Like, you don't have the tumor anymore. There's, you know, basically nothing left that we can see with the visible eye. So that was just like, crazy. That was just nuts. And I was I'm like, crying. I, if my mom was there, she'd be crying. Like, yeah, no, I mean, mom was, everybody, so everybody was stunned and yeah. just kind of like shocked and didn't know what to think at the time. And um, you were just. I, I was happy and I was like, that's awesome. And, uh, but I, you know, they said just for precautionary reasons, I had to go through another year of chemo after that, which wasn't fun. But at that point I knew if it was just for precautions and that I, it was so I didn't have to go through any of this ever again. And that was basically the, the goal. And so n now I guess, cause there's no cure for the type of tumor that I had. So, uh, or the, the cancer itself. So the idea is to have me be in what they call extended remission, uh, where they think that they have everything, that everything's gone, there's no cancers, there's no tumors, there's no, um, no nothing shows up in my blood work or anything like that, but they can't say for sure that it's going to be gone forever, which is tough, but I know that it's at a point where I can kind of control uh, everything by what I put into my body and how I eat, how I exercise, um, kind of avoiding junk foods and processed foods and just eating healthy whole meals that are, you know, I, I cook a lot now. My girlfriend and I cook all the time, um, make dinners as opposed to like pop in, pop it in like a frozen TV dinner or anything like that. Now, like everything's cooked, you know, I don't eat a lot of like red meat or, um, you know, processed foods anymore. Everything's, you know, chicken or uh, organic eggs or uh, fish. Like I love seafood, so we'll have that or holy pasta or you know any number of things. And we've actually found that there's a lot of good things to eat that are really tasty and really enjoyable. Yeah, um, it's amazing what happens. Yeah, I know, right? It's amazing, that, and right? you're kind of forced to learn that stuff, but. Yeah, I kind of been able to, to to cook now. I make myself breakfast every morning, whether it's uh, like eggs and you know onions and peppers and vegetables, or like this morning I had uh, a bowl of oatmeal with chia seed, flax seed, blueberries, strawberries, and bananas, and like it was really good, and I enjoy <laughs> that. So I got kind of a lot has changed about me and my diet, and that's why I feel so confident that everything going forward will be will be good because now I'm kind of in a point where I can control it. And uh, as long as I continue to maintain my body and my health and everything, I, there shouldn't be any issues. Awesome. Well, you mentioned you and your girlfriend cooking together. Do you guys have a dog? No. Here's my random question coming from Ted, who wants <laughs> to know if you had a dog. What I, think, dog? I think I know Ted. And oh, do you? Okay. I do. And... Um, no, Ted is a, I think it's a, a, a golden doodle, and uh, it's an awesome dog, and I would love to have one. So that's probably why that question came in. Okay. Um, yeah, no, there's a, it's a golden doodle, and uh, he's an awesome dog. But uh, no, I have a, a cat. My sister's cat is here somewhere, and it just jumped up on my lap like five minutes ago. Oh, but, really? Maybe. Yeah, I, I kept him out of the screen. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I guess I would say to, if you had a message to people, and I'm sure you do, who are going through this, and we talked about this a little bit, you know, what your journey means, and it's not just, you know, to people who are going through cancer, but when we look at this SU community, the number of people who are here, but their father lost a job and they can't afford to go anymore, or they're battling unemployment, or they're battling depression or anxiety, or whatever that struggle is, what do you say? Because you've been through, I mean, one of the most ultimate struggles in your life. What do you say to them? Um, I, I just, I kind of try to remember and remind people that, like, there's always positive things to take from anything, and that pretty much no matter what your situation is, is that there are people who are worse off and you yourself could be worse off. Um, Cause I know one of the things that I struggled with when I was, you know, initially going through everything was that 
you know, I, I was like, you know, anything else happened to me, like it wouldn't be as bad because, you know, I, you know, tomorrow morning I'd wake up and I'd do whatever I needed to do. But the fact that with this, there was that whole thing where, well, you might not wake up and there's no, you know, there's no, there's nothing else you can do from that on, that point on. Like you can't help, you know, your family. You can't, you know, be there for your mom, your dad, your sister, your girlfriend. You can't. So there's that 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 there's that definitive ending point uh, for me, which was you know it was hard to kind of kind of deal with and kind of cope with that situation. That I would always think that any other situation, you know, if um, you know if I lost my leg, like I could still get up the next morning and I could go and I'd be alive. I'd still be able to to be around people and to help and to do something and. Uh, there's just just anything, and I, I just thought, you know, even if if I had no money, then I could, you know, go and get a job and or go and do something. But with this, there was no next step. There was no, you know, there was nothing that I could do really. It was kind of out of my control, and that was uh, something that was so difficult for me to to kind of handle. That when I see other people or like. <laughs> my girlfriend or anybody or my parents struggle it's kind of like listen you know it's not fun but yeah it's not fun but it could be a lot worse there's people who are worse off than you are and um there's people who are a lot worse off than i was and uh like i i never forgot that no matter you know even if i was you know gonna die at 22 years old there's people that died at five years old like the fact that i got 22 years was something that i was very appreciative uh, very appreciative of and that I was you know just going to try and make the most out of each day and try and just get better and do some good and that's why I'm really excited to you know do this uplifting athletes thing and while I've, while I've done the race for hope which is a, a brain tumor and a brain cancer fundraiser for the last three years and you know that's been something that's been just it's nice to to be a part of and to go to and you see everybody else that's been affected, and um, you realize pretty quickly that, you know, I was extremely, extremely fortunate, even though my tumor was big and it was, you know, a, a very um, malignant type that I was able to overcome, and now I can go and continue on to do whatever it is that I wanted to do. And um, if football doesn't work out, I just – you know, want to make sure that I do something that I enjoy every day. Uh, I think, uh, like my Twitter profile, I love the saying. It's uh, uh, it's appreciate today because yesterday's gone and tomorrow may never come. And I think that's kind of the way I try to live. That every day is, you know, you enjoy it, be happy. You know, regardless of what you're doing, you just kind of, you know understand that there's way worse places you could be i've been in way worse i know other people have been in way worse so um you know but going forward i think if it's not football it's hopefully something that i can do that i enjoy and then while doing that hopefully i can either make money to help give back or spend time to help give back and to make a difference you know with this because i know before i was ever diagnosed i mean years before i was ever diagnosed there's people that spent their time, their money, their efforts to, to find research that ultimately is the reason I'm here today because, I mean, the medicine I took, uh, it wasn't on the market till like 2006. Wow. So if this is something that possibly was found when I showed up on campus, they didn't have the treatment for it. Now, my senior year, they had the treatment for it, and uh, I was able to kind of go through and and – come out successfully through everything. Well, as we promised when we said we would do this Google Plus Hangout, what an inspiring hour it's been. And I know Carol asked what NFL team you'd like to play for. Your answer to that is any of 32. Yeah, any, any one of the 32. Anybody's hiring. I, yeah. uh, I'd be more than happy. That's awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so much for this. I mean, really sharing your story and your passion for Syracuse and football and just 
you know, the, the positive message that you bring. Stay positive, that hashtag, and, and everything else. And I know, well, all, if you share some details with me or with Sam um, about the Uplifting Athletes cause and the, the first fundraiser in June, that'd be awesome. We'll share that with folks and, and let them know how to get involved because you've certainly inspired us all, and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, and I will definitely get you guys all the information. You can share it, and uh, hopefully we can make it a, a, a nice tradition to, to add to all Syracuse's great traditions. I want to know what's on the menu tonight. Ooh, I don't know. We had uh, <laughs> we had pasta with, uh, with uh, turkey meat sauce last night, and it was oh. quite good. And um, so we might have fish tonight. So we'll see. We had fish the other night. It was good. So I'll let you know. Good eating, Rob. All right. Hey, well, thank you so much. Well, uh, we just shared the link, and this will be up as soon as we close down. You'll be able to watch the link anytime for those of you tuned in. And Rob Long, S Rob Long SU has been our hashtag for this event. Rob Long has been our guest, and thank you so much, Rob. From thank you, guys, and, and hopefully I'll see you uh, at the event tomorrow night. I would love for you to come to success All right. in Philadelphia. Thank you very much, and hopefully All right. see you on an NFL field sometime soon. All right, that sounds good, guys. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, Rob.